spy. Inside sits one of the most advanced intelligence operations ever conceived, the National Security Agency. Using advanced technology, the NSA steals enemy secrets and defends the nation from emerging threats. After 9-11, the agency basically had to swivel on a dime. Suddenly, terrorism became number one target. With the power to reach around the world and into foreign communications, the NSA strikes fear in enemies and triggers controversy at home. For the first time since 9-11, the NSA opens its doors to documentary cameras and grants an exclusive first-time television interview with its current director. As we reveal the agency's key role in protecting the country, from protecting the military against cyber attacks, to hunting down America's most wanted enemy. Join us for an unprecedented look inside one of America's most secretive intelligence agencies. Under the cover of night, two Black Hawks and two Chinook helicopters take off from an airbase in eastern Afghanistan. Inside are 23 highly trained U.S. Navy SEALs, the elite SEAL Team 6. 90 minutes later, the helicopters descend from the night sky over Pakistan. The SEAL Team storms the compound and bursts into the house. Inside, they find the elusive Al-Qaeda leader, Osama bin Laden. He is quickly shot dead. After just 38 minutes on the ground, SEAL Team 6 is back in the air, headed for safety. How had the United States found the elusive leader of Al-Qaeda hiding in the middle of Pakistan? The answer lies 7,000 miles away in the unprecedented collaboration of the U.S. intelligence community including the work of one of its most secretive agencies, headquartered 25 miles from the nation's capital. Here within the wooded Maryland suburbs sits one of the key players behind the hunt for Osama bin Laden, the National Security Agency. Since 1952, the NSA has utilized the newest and most advanced technology to gather intelligence, detect threats, and protect America's secrets. From the beginning, the NSA has been shrouded in secrecy. Approaching vehicles are met by highly trained and heavily armed police officers. Barricades prevent outsiders from storming the gates. To thwart electronic eavesdropping, these seemingly unassuming buildings are lined with copper mesh. The information gathered here informs our leaders and determines the fate of our nation. Since 9-11, no documentary cameras have been allowed inside, until now. Our cameras take you deep inside the National Security Agency, down the sprawling hallways of this over two million square foot compound, into one of the most highly secured rooms in the United States. The National Security Operations Center. One new customer request uh, for any information regarding security threats. The economics minister's meeting uh, in Jakarta. President or vice president going to be there? No, sir. This is a ministerial level meeting. The commerce secretary will be representing the U.S. The National Security Operations Center is energy central for NSA. It's really the emergency room for intelligence. We have to use the power of our intelligence systems to gain the information that our national leaders need to make decisions. So we're in the information gathering business. NSOC really is watching all the current developments that could turn into problems or it could be issues for us. So they'd be on the lookout for either first indications of a terrorist attack or first responses to a terrorist attack. Are there Americans who are in danger overseas someplace? Anything that could, you know, involve death or destruction or an imminent change in our security situation, those are the things that are going to bubble to NSOC's top priority.
All comm circuits are up at this time, but the comms cable in the Red Sea that was damaged yesterday due to the volcanic eruption is still out. Okay, and do we know how long? Ask any senior government official, and at some point or other, they'll tell you, yes, they got something from NSOC that really was, you know, perhaps even earth-shaking. For the Obama administration, the NSA provided critical support during a pivotal military and intelligence triumph. The daring overnight raid that resulted in the killing of Osama bin Laden. But while the agency declines to comment about its role, there is one person with the highest level of clearance who does acknowledge the NSA's key role in the operation. No one piece of information and no one agency made this possible. You did it together. CIA, National Reconnaissance Office, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, National Security Agency, you made it possible for us to achieve the most significant victory yet in our war to defeat al-Qaeda. Critical missions like counterterrorism often stretch around the world and involve the close monitoring of thousands of sources and millions of emails, phone calls, and other forms of communication. You've got trillions of cell phone calls. There are billions of emails sent in a day. The vast majority of those are totally inconsequential. The trouble is, the one that you're looking for is somewhere in that stack. So this is the ultimate needle in a haystack problem. To process this critical information, the NSA specializes in a form of high-tech surveillance known as signals intelligence. Signals intelligence is exploiting foreign adversary communications to answer questions that are asked by our nation's leaders. It can be the exploitation of personal communications, whether on the phone or sending emails. The NSA's Signals Intelligence Directorate is the agency's largest department. Although the NSA could not confirm the exact number, analysts here intercept millions of communications per week. The NSA is intercepting probably something on the order of about eight times the entire collection of the Library of Congress every single day. The NSA analyzes conversations in 130 different languages. Hundreds of language analysts are employed to translate thousands of phone calls and other communications daily. Those communications often contain vital information on the whereabouts and activities of terrorists and other adversaries. You really need to understand your target very well. You have to understand the culture in which they operate, understand the nuances of what they may be saying. And knowing your target means often being able to recognize the person just by the sound of their voice. They may say something that sounds kind of out of character or may use words that they don't normally use, which may tip you off that there's something going on that's not in the norm. These intercepted foreign conversations allow the NSA to better understand America's adversaries. But to build the most complete picture possible, the agency is looking at more than communications. It's also things like weapon systems, radars, telemetry signals on space launches, ballistic missile launches, those kind of things. You can imagine that our military leadership needs to understand how an adversary's weapons can be used against us. To detect these electronic signals, the NSA operates a special division known as the Electronic Intelligence, or ELINT, lab. Here, ELINT technicians carefully monitor signals used in radar and missile guidance systems to warn American troops when the enemy could be planning to attack. The NSA deputy director explains how electronic intelligence can protect aircraft on a potentially hostile mission. If we had an F-16 that was attempting to penetrate an enemy defense, um, they would want to know, are the radars up or down? We could know something about that signal by capturing it, analyzing it, understanding what our adversaries intend to do. Is it in a search mode? Is it in an attack mode? Um, has it locked onto that aircraft and is about to fire on that aircraft? Every day, especially during a crisis, millions of signals from around the world come into the NSA. That raw information is sent to analysts who attempt to build a more complete understanding of these foreign adversaries and any impending threats they might be orchestrating. 
NSA is a collection agency. They collect signals intelligence. Most of it's going to go to analysts who are going to try and put it in a, in a broader context or use it to build an analytical picture that will then be the basis for a report that goes to a policymaker. On a day-to-day -day basis, NSA produces more intelligence reports than any other agency. General Keith Alexander is the director of the NSA. It's up to him to provide the latest information on impending threats and adversarial activities. To the nation's top policymaker, President Barack Obama. Providing intelligence for our, our, our senior leaders is clearly important. There's always things that happen that we may not see. And so those are things that concern me. We do not want to make a mistake. It has terrible consequences for our nation. When critical situations arise, General Alexander meets with key NSA personnel in this secure room. Here, they conference with leaders of multiple intelligence agencies via secure video link to carefully review the latest analysis and present their findings to the nation's leaders. During the crisis, such as the discovery of a credible terrorist threat, the NSA has just 10 minutes to get the word out through a high-priority alert called a critic. A critic is the highest precedence of a message that we have. That will go immediately to the recipients around the agency and to other organizations in, in the U.S. government, so they get to see that immediately. We send that to the White House within 10 minutes of recognition. We make no attempt to slow up the initial report because we don't want that to be filtered at all. But you can imagine, often a first report can be wrong. So the real job is the validation of the report. We actually then have 20 minutes to validate that the report was correct. For decades, the NSA has utilized the latest technology and techniques to stay ahead of its adversaries. But on one fateful September morning, a new kind of enemy, using unconventional tactics, temporarily gained an advantage. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. In the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, the American intelligence community was forced to quickly regroup. The fact that 19 hijackers were able to enter the U.S. unimpeded, orchestrating the deadliest terrorist attacks in American history, had an immediate and lasting effect on the intelligence community. 9-11 changed our lives here at the National Security Agency. Ever since, we have been working 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to prevent that kind of tragedy ever happening to our nation again. And we're committed and dedicated to doing that. After 9-11, we shifted our target to the terrorist target. And that is a network. So in order to beat a network, you have to be a network. And that was the, the key transformation we made over the last 10 years is to be the most agile intelligence agency we could be. The key thing that happened after 9-11 is that the agency basically had to swivel on a dime. All the targets that NSA was listening to basically changed overnight. Terrorism, which was a very, very small part of what NSA was doing uh, on September 10th, 2001, uh, the following day suddenly became number one target whether it's terrorists that come in many shapes and forms, whether it's the threat of weapons of mass destruction, it's a multifaceted set of threats that the United States faces, and therefore we need to be able to discover, anticipate, and report on all of those. In the years following 9-11, the NSA's resources and reach drastically expanded. Everybody expanded after 9-11. Everybody got more money. And so, um, NSA suddenly had more money for training, they had more money to hire people, and so they surged along with everybody else. Many of those new resources went into expanding the NSA's technological capabilities as the agency ramped up research and development of cutting-edge science and technology. Those new capabilities allow the agency to better sift through billions of foreign communications. In the aftermath of 9-11, our role in research was basically to help chart the future microelectronics, advanced computing, 
communications and information processing, advanced mathematics. It's really a matter of designing tools that surgically sort of cut through the uh, amazing amount of information, find out what's important, turn that information into actionable intelligence. The NSA allowed our cameras an exclusive look inside one of their state-of-the-art research facilities. We're a very technical organization and we have to stay on the cutting edge of technology. And we're always pushing the envelope. Working at the NSA is definitely, you are on the cutting edge. You are farther along technology than the commercial sector is and where the rest of the public is, so you are always at the forefront. Here, the NSA engineers new tools to help break enemy codes and decipher encrypted communications. But the agency isn't just breaking codes, they're also making them, as they develop new technology to better secure America's communication networks. I'm particularly interested in applying security concepts to optical communications as we head towards um, faster and higher data rates. We need to be able to do so in a secure fashion. In the end, higher speed, faster encryption allows us to better protect ourselves against our adversaries. The practice of code making and code breaking is known as cryptology something the NSA has been perfecting since its earliest days. The agency's military predecessors created codes and decoded enemy ciphers during World War II. Artifacts from that era are housed inside the hidden recesses of the NSA's cryptologic museum. Patrick Wheaton is the museum's curator. We're going to take a look at something that has never been seen on TV before and probably hasn't been seen by most of the employees of the National Security Agency. This is the vault of the National Cryptologic Museum. This is only part of our collection, but what we have in this room is pretty significant in terms of tracing the history of cryptology. The vault houses one of the largest collections of historical code making and code breaking equipment in the world. We have items that date back to World War II, and we have items that really are part of the present day. This is a Stu-3 phone that is uh, typical of the device that was used by former President George Bush on the morning of 9-11 when he was at the elementary school and was informed of the fact that uh, our country had been attacked. By using the Stu-3, President Bush was able to communicate critical orders through a secure connection encrypted over a standard telephone line. Encrypted voice communication is something the NSA and its predecessors have been working on for decades. The best way to move classified information is simply via the human voice. Prior to 1943, there were no devices that were available that would provide for secure voice. In 1943, the United States, in conjunction with private industry, was able to produce Sig Sally, which you see here. Sig Sally was the very first secure voice network. This device, when it was up and running, weighed 65 tons. It also required 15 people to operate it. For the very first time, General Marshall in Washington could contact General MacArthur in the Far East, and they could have a conversation on a phone uh, and know that it was going to be secure. During World War II, Nazi Germany utilized their own encryption device that they too believed to be unbreakable, the infamous Enigma machine. This is an authentic German Enigma device. It was invented in the 1920s, and during World War II, it was the communications workhorse of the German military. It could produce permutations of 3 times 10 to the 114th power, and in the minds of the German leadership, this was a perfect encryption device. The Enigma was able to produce more possible letter combinations than the number of atoms in the observable universe, something the device achieved by using a system of rotors, which substituted letters according to a preset schedule. The Allies used an electromechanical device called the bomb, which simulated the Enigma rotors using electric currents, allowing Allied cryptologists to precisely calculate all possible Enigma combinations. When the Allies broke Enigma, they warned in the Atlantic change in our favor. Some of the things that the National Security Agency does to protect our nation are on that level. 
we can't afford to be wrong because at times lives of Americans are on the line. The modern day cryptologist relies on much more advanced computing and mathematical techniques to fight a new kind of enemy in terror networks across the globe. Roger Barkin is a cryptanalyst who graduated with a mathematics degree from Harvard. I interviewed in several different places, uh, you know, Wall Street kind of firms, uh, defense contractor kind of things. When I interviewed the NSA, I was really excited about my interview. The kind of problems that they were working on, really the kind of things that a mathematician like me could get excited about. With such complex problems to solve, Roger and his fellow cryptanalysts call on the NSA supercomputers. To succeed as a codebreaker, you need to have access to the fastest computers available. It gives us an advantage over all of our foreign adversaries. Whatever encryption scheme they come up with using their computers, because our computers are going to be that much faster, it's going to give us a leg up in that war. With some of the fastest computers in the world, the NSA is now better equipped to break codes and gather information than ever before. But in the aftermath of 9-11, the agency's listening powers begin to spark controversy at home. As the investigation into the 9-11 terrorist attacks heats up, the NSA makes a chilling discovery. At least two of the 19 hijackers had been on the agency's radar in the years leading up to 2001. But, as the 9-11 Commission would later conclude, poor coordination within the intelligence community prevented those terrorists from being tracked effectively. We were unprepared. We did not grasp the magnitude of a threat that had been gathering over a considerable period of time. As the U.S. intelligence community comes together to prevent future terrorist attacks, another complication to the NSA's foreign intelligence mission comes to light. In the cyber age, adversaries communicate electronically over the same U.S. networks as Americans, blurring the line between foreign and domestic communication. For the National Security Agency, our authority, our limitation is to focus on the foreign domain. So we're a foreign intelligence agency, but it's a very different world than it was, say, 1986 when I got started. After 9-11, there is a sense within the NSA that the lines and the rules have to change. It couldn't do all the things within the traditional regulations and rules that it felt that it could do to protect the country. What came out of that, of course, was a secret order from President Bush that allowed NSA to monitor people inside the United States. That secret Bush administration order authorized the NSA to collect intelligence domestically and caused some Americans to wonder if the NSA was listening to them. The controversy surrounding the change became known to critics as warrantless wiretapping. The more secretive an intelligence organization is about its activities, the more we tend to be a little afraid about what it's up to. And I think that's one of the legacies of 9-11. For the people who wonder how NSA uses the capabilities that it's been authorized to develop, they should know that there's a rich set of oversight mechanisms. The executive branch, the judicial branch, the legislative branch, all have some means of oversight of the National Security Agency. Despite what a lot of people believe, they're not really interested in your personal life. They have much more important things to do than to listen to you arranging a date or talking to your mom or ordering groceries. They really don't have time for this. In 2008, Congress amended the law governing the NSA's collection practices. Those changes allow the NSA to continue with many of the collection efforts it made under the Bush order. Despite the controversy, the NSA maintains its mission has always been the collection of foreign intelligence. On occasion, a U.S. person could be the source of foreign intelligence. But if and ever we would ever target a U.S. person, we would have to get a warrant uh, from an appropriately uh, authorized court of law. Right? The rules in that regard are very clear. The bedrock commitment of NSA is to conduct those missions within the law. And that means within the Constitution, the federal laws that apply and govern all of our activities. 
the, the technology is always changing and the laws are changing. But the other thing that makes for a, a very dynamic environment is the changes that we see in our adversaries. And by adversaries, I mean terrorists or cyber attackers. In today's world, the adversaries are all over the place. They range from nation states to, to anybody. Dickie George is an advanced mathematician with the NSA's Information Assurance Directorate. He spent over 40 years with the agency and helped guide it into the cyber age. Part of that job was to find ways to encrypt U.S. government and military communications. When I talk to people in the military, the first thing they always say is, I want to make sure that my troops are protected. So make sure that my information is safe. Here, he demonstrates how advanced mathematics can be used to encrypt a message between two soldiers. If the message is 65, you take 65, raise it to the 17th power, and you get 2790. To decrypt it, you take that 2790, raise it to the power 2753, and that would give you the answer 65, which is, in fact, your message. Even though people know the encrypt variable so that anybody can encrypt a message, they don't know the decrypt variable, so only you can decrypt the message. The world has really changed. The adversary can use new technology against us, both to protect their stuff and to attack our stuff. Protecting our information is the most important aspect of our job. It's really important for us to make young people understand that there is a career in cryptography in protecting communications. You see hackers doing things that could do so much for us if, if they were working with us. In 2008, the U.S. military suffers a cyber intrusion. A manipulated flash drive is inserted into a military laptop somewhere in the Middle East. On that drive is malicious code, a virus. The virus uploads itself onto the internal network of U.S. Central Command, creating an opening from which classified military documents could be transferred to unknown servers under foreign control. It's the worst breach of U.S. military computers ever. Is the United States under cyber attack? The U.S. Defense Department network has been breached. A malicious computer virus has infiltrated U.S. Defense Department computers, potentially opening the door to thousands of highly classified military documents. In today's cyber age, a nearly invisible war has broken out on an ever-changing battlefield. America's communication networks are more vulnerable than ever. In today's world, it's cyber. Cyber is espionage and cyber is a threat. And the fact that they are combined in the same group means that that, that group of spies is now dangerous. They have a weapon as opposed to just spying. The soldiers are very much dependent on networks on their command and control network for communications. So it is extremely important that their networks are available and that the communications are secure. To defend military networks from threats like the 2008 virus, the NSA created the NSA CSS Threat Operations Center, or NTOC. An ultra high security 24 hour a day nerve center to protect Defense Department networks from cyber intrusions. This is the only time television cameras have been allowed on the new NTOC floor to view a training exercise. Sherry Ramsey is NTOC director. Hey, what's going on in here today? We're waiting on some subject matter expert to come in here. We already have a call in. They're going to be in here. We'll get started in a few minutes on that. Okay. Try to work through that. During the training exercise, as Miss Ramsey checks in with one of her two shift commanders, the NTOC team detects a threat to the network, one potentially similar to the 2008 virus that infected U.S. Central Command. What's up, Mike? I hate to interrupt you guys. Oh, um, we've got a bunch of our sensors lighting up, and I've got the guys upstairs checking to make sure that it's all okay, but it's just too much and too much of a coincidence not to be real. Let me talk to our leadership, all right. and we'll gather up the folks. Roger. The Department of Defense's networks are scanned or probed over 250,000 times an hour every day. They range from high school and college kids attempting to show off their skills 
to criminals uh, all the way to sophisticated nation state activity who clearly want to understand how the military operates. He has an issue with some sensors, something's happening on their lighting up and such, and he's got some information he wants to share, and we're going to see what we can do about it. And we're going to need the CEO, the, the commando, the SC Pro, the SIO, and the CSAs. Come on back to the conference room and have a session. NTOC brought together NSA's signals intelligence authorities, our information assurance authorities. What that allows us to do is to look at the Department of Defense's networks, look at the foreign intelligence, um, get some idea of what the threat is. There are sophisticated adversaries, not so sophisticated adversaries. The thing to remember is you don't need to be sophisticated to be effective. There is over 68,000 hacker tools that are already made available. And so these are programs that people can actually download and use to get into the system. What our sensor grid's seen is we've got, you know, like a half dozen different places that are starting to light up and beacon back. If you can discover 68,000 tools by anybody just using a search engine, um, can you imagine what other tools and capabilities exist with other potential sophisticated adversaries? We are tracking what's going on. We're paying attention to what's happening, trying to characterize the signals. They have no rules, they have no authorities, they can come and go as they will, and they do what they want whenever they want, and they can do it all in a millisecond. That's how fast cyber time is. So we have to be prepared to understand not only the threat, not only their capabilities and intentions, but be prepared in cyber time to defend our networks against them. Clearly something's going on. This kind of stuff doesn't happen normally, uh, at least not that we've seen off of these sites. Okay, thank you. Commando, can we get together to uh, get countermeasure options? I think we have all the team here, so we'll get right on that. Let's begin the countermeasures, continue on the analysis, and let's begin reporting. Okay, ready, guys? Yep. With the NSA's technical expertise and the coordinated effort of multiple government agencies, the NTOC team was able to contain the threat. It was work like this that in 2008 helped the NSA and Department of Defense eradicate the virus infecting U.S. Central Command's internal network. While the NSA secures Defense Department networks from the NTOC floor, other agency personnel are hard at work thousands of miles away, protecting American troops in the military's most dangerous war zones. As the war in Afghanistan unfolds halfway around the world, the U.S. military is forced to adjust its approach in the face of an enemy unlike any they've ever seen. Back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, we had an adversary of the Soviet Union, and they were very much like us. Same intent, same motivation, same kind of capabilities and resources. It was a very symmetric game at that time. There was a line in the sand. You didn't go beyond that line. And today's world is completely different. The adversaries are all over the place. It takes nowhere near the same amount of resources to do things today as it did. What remains true, and has since the NSA's inception, is that U.S. cryptologists play a vital role in American military operations, risking their lives alongside other military personnel. In fact, one of the first Americans killed during the Vietnam War was an army cryptologist. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the unconventional insurgent wars brought many NSA analysts to the front lines. Those analysts provide American soldiers with the most timely, actionable intelligence possible. Intelligence that saves U.S. and allied lives. Sometimes you have to be there. You have to understand um, what the organizations you're serving actually need. So our civilians deploy, as our military deploy, to be there inside the fabric of their organizations to understand what they really need of us and to make our best, um, our, our fullest possible contribution. Hundreds of our folks are deployed in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in other areas around the world. And they're putting their lives at risk. But they're there because they make a difference to the operations that our military conducts. More than 160 U.S. cryptologists have given their lives supporting such operations. A memorial wall honoring their silent sacrifice sits just inside the NSA main entrance. Yet there's still a waiting list of NSA personnel who volunteer for action. Working on the front lines with the U.S. military, NSA analysts provide valuable intelligence in the hunt for insurgents. 
But they aren't just listening in on our adversaries. They're also making sure those adversaries can't listen in on us. Look, they're only doing two things in NSA, offense and defense. They're breaking into other people's comms to produce signals intelligent. The other thing they're doing is trying to make sure that nobody does it to us. This is like to catch a thief. Who would you send? Well, the guy who knows how to break into a bank. The NSA provides the U.S. military with the technology and expertise necessary to keep mission-sensitive communications from falling into enemy hands. Those tools and techniques are developed by the agency's Information Assurance Directorate. Deborah Plunkett is its director. Our nation has a need to communicate and to articulate direction, orders, military plans, policies, uh, strategic intent. Our responsibility here ultimately is to enable communications to happen in a secure way. And literally, the work that we do results in lives being saved. To protect military secrets, U.S. cryptologists must remain in harm's way on the ground. For fear of giving away their identity and being targeted during future operations, few NSA employees would speak on camera about their war zone experience. Master Sergeant Tom Morrison is a Marine who's retiring after being stationed twice at the NSA. He's completed multiple tours in the Middle East, where he worked alongside NSA civilians as both a language analyst and cryptanalyst, or codebreaker. No longer concerned with remaining anonymous, he's agreed to discuss his experiences. Cryptanalysis in the field is, in one way, it's more challenging, and in another way, it's more rewarding, because your life is one of the lives that's on the line. You are trying to find the adversary before he finds you. There is no safe area. But when you find the bad guy, and you put them away, you get that sense of, of satisfaction like when a policeman puts away a, a violent criminal, the streets are that much safer because I've done my job. Before any NSA military or civilian cryptologist head to the war zone, they come here to the top secret Mead Operations Center where they prepare for deployment. The NSA allowed our cameras unprecedented access to the mock as we film the side of the room supporting those in the field. The opposite side, where vital classified intelligence is analyzed and distributed, was strictly off limits. Hey, Officer Wilson, where are we at with the... Uh... On this side of the floor of the Meade Operations Center, we are providing access to the information that NSA provides to all the folks downrange. A bad day over here means a lot of folks aren't getting their information that they need to track the insurgents. On the other side of the operations floor uh, are the analysts who are actually working, using a lot of that information in direct support of going after terrorists uh, and insurgents who are uh, using explosive devices or other weapons to attack friendly forces. Uh, so uh, at that end of the floor, if they have a bad day, then ultimately someone may lose their life. Go, 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 go. We can bring to the fight game-changing technologies that might not otherwise be available. Back up. Our adversaries are very savvy, they're very smart, and they're using these latest technologies against us. So we have to have our technical workforce develop those cutting-edge technologies to exploit those kinds of communications and capabilities. To stay ahead of its adversaries, the NSA employs talented engineers who develop new encryption technologies. I am testing a new cryptographic product. It's going to help secure soldiers' lives out there. It's going to help secure their communications as they're trying to talk back and forth while they're out in the field. Anything that is going to have some sort of cryptographic secret protection in, built into it, we don't want someone else to be able to steal that information, so we bring it into a completely shielded room so the data can't leave. The NSA goes to extreme lengths to prevent its data and technologies from leaving its highly secured facilities. Entire buildings and hundreds of agency employees are dedicated to keeping classified secrets from falling into adversary hands and potentially compromising our nation's security. The NSA is one of the world's largest intelligence agencies, home to approximately 35,000 employees working around the world. While the agency's profile is now bigger than ever, they insist on keeping secret most of what they actually do. 
For the NSA, national security requires ultimate secrecy. Every agency in the intelligence community has its own culture. Now, certainly one of the things that they all have in common is a dedication to secrecy. You'll find that NSA people are really particularly closed-lipped about what they do. From the moment you join the organization, it's just a series of briefings on maintaining secrecy, maintaining silence. It's like the old security posters from World War II that loose lips sink ships. The NSA goes to extreme lengths to protect its secrets. The mere shredding of classified materials won't suffice. Instead, sensitive papers are carried to dozens of burn bag chutes spread throughout the agency. The bags are placed in the chutes and sucked through a system of tubes to the NSA's on-site paper pulping facility where they aren't burned, but combined with water and heated to become an indistinguishable and now unclassified gray goo. The pulp is then squeezed, baled and sent to area paper producers to be turned into pizza boxes and other recycled material. There are some papers the NSA does keep. In fact, about 65,000 cubic feet of classified documents in the NSA's top secret record center. No outside cameras have ever been allowed inside this immense archive, until now. This is where some of the nation's most sensitive secrets have been held, protected from the eyes of adversaries for decades, and preserved for American history. While much of what's contained in these boxes still requires safekeeping, a series of presidential orders has allowed the NSA to declassify as much of the material as possible. We can't release information that we're still using as part of our active collection efforts. Information that may reveal our capabilities could harm us. Should we determine there be no harm to national security, we will release the information, we'll actually stamp it and go through it and release it to the National Archives. Under the presidential order, Documents reviewed for routine declassification are at least 25 years old. In the course of our routine declassification, we came upon this correspondence file from 1955. There was three letters from Dr. John Nash. As you may know, he was a subject of a movie, A Beautiful Mind. He was a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at MIT and a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Nash's letters, along with the NSA's classified analysis of them, have been locked up for more than 50 years. Only now is this file being declassified in front of our cameras for the American public to see. He sent in his ideas for an enciphering, deciphering machine. And he even provided us colored descriptions of what his um, machine would look like. Although the NSA didn't use the Nash designs, his letters and the agency's analysis of his ideas remain secret until now to ensure that neither fell into enemy hands. Maintaining these secrets is a way of life at the NSA. To work there, you must undergo extensive background checks, be a U.S. citizen, and even undergo psychological and polygraph exams. NSA employees are prohibited from bringing cell phones and other potential recording devices into the building. They also shouldn't expect to have a key to their office. Instead, keys must be placed in a barcoded box and returned to a secure vending machine, which keeps track of who has which keys. In order for our cameras to gain unparalleled access to the NSA secure compound, every piece of our equipment was checked for prohibited items. Bomb sniffing dogs went over everything. And before our tapes could leave the NSA compound, security and classification experts reviewed every second of footage to prevent anything sensitive from getting out. Anything the NSA's experts weren't comfortable with was permanently deleted. The secrecy may be extreme, but for the NSA, that secrecy serves a higher purpose. We are the silent warriors, and uh, that's part of our ethic here. And so whenever we have a success, we're going to use that same technique against the next bad guy. And so we don't uh, want to trumpet it so that we can continue to be successful and protect America. We are there serving, again, in silence to ensure that we're doing everything we can to provide the intelligence that our nation needs. 
while we can't tell every American what we do, what we can say is we have tremendous people. And it's a privilege and honor to serve here, it really is. We've had 10 years of protecting this country. We've had a lot of successes and we've had luck. Our luck is not always going to hold in this area. That's the thing that keeps me up at night is protecting our people and our allies. I think that's critical that the American people understand how important we take that mission and these obligations.